All right, Kweku, I'd like to first of all start by welcoming you formally uh, back home to Ghana. Thank you. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be home. It's good to be home, actually. It is? It is. Um, so, I mean, it's been, well, maybe 26 hours since I got back. And it's been such a tough journey the last seven years, seven and a half years, that um, the violence, the violent way in which it ended meant that as I was coming back to the country, all I wanted to do was to get home to my family. You mean the removal process? The removal process, yes. It was remarkably violent and completely unnecessary. And whilst on the one hand it made me realize why it was so important for us to fight as hard as we did to ensure that I wasn't deported, on the other hand, it made me realize that this fight has done a lot of damage to a lot of people. The vision of violence that we have seen, the vision of state violence that we have seen, has taught us so much. So when I got home yesterday, it felt like I was free for the first time in seven years. Wow. The, the last time I met you, yes, there was you were in the in deportation. Yes. Okay. Very close to Heathrow. Yeah. So yeah, of course. Yes, you met me in the detention center in Hammondsworth, and at that stage, um, we were close to deportation, but we we'd achieved a stay on the removal. Yes. And we were applying for a judicial review for the the judges to consider whether or not the way the Home Office. The UK Home Office had made its decision was right, was lawful. So they allowed me out on bail. So about a month ago, just over a month ago, they released me on bail. Then I was on bail. We had the judicial review hearing. They actually used the court as a way to manipulate the story in order that the final reckoning would be that I'm a dishonest person and that I am in some ways incapable of redemption and that the judge literally said that I was dishonest about my dishonesty and therefore I should be deported and never given the chance to make a claim as to why I should be allowed to remain in the UK. That was pretty serious. It's incredibly harsh because there was no evidence whatsoever to support that position. In fact, three judges before him who'd assessed the evidence had said that actually my contributions to the UK since my release from prison have been in the public interest. Now, what we think is that the UK government realized that the only way they could convince the Ghanaian government to accept my deportation was to ensure that there were no more legal avenues for me to contest against the decision in the UK, which is very gracious of the Ghanaian government. However, what the UK government did was manipulate that process to ensure that there was no possibility for a legal avenue, a legal resolution. And then once they'd done that piece of work through the upper tribunal, Judge Ockleton in the upper tribunal, they then put me back in detention this Monday when I went to report. What happened then from Monday? So on Monday I reported, they put me in a van and I'm sorry, I'm really hot. So I'm, I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I mean, you're, to... you're, you're sweating quite a bit. And, uh, we can excuse you. Uh, I'm because... not used to the temperature. It's a 20 degree temperature change. I know. So um, yeah, we can excuse <laughs> you. Forgive me. Um, but um, they put me in a van immediately. They drove me from... Glasgow, where I went to report, all the way down to Harmonsworth, nine hours in a, in a van with two escorts. Glasgow, that's Scotland. In Scotland. So I lived in Scotland. So since my release from prison, I've been living in Scotland right. with two friends and their two sons who are my godsons. Um, so they drove me all the way down to Harmonsworth and then detained me in the same detention center where we met 
about six weeks ago. Now, on Tuesday, my Member of Parliament, Hannah Bardell, um, who has done an incredible job trying to convince both the Immigration Minister, Caroline Noakes, and Sajid Javid, the UK Home Secretary, that there were good reasons not to deport me. She did a great job of explaining to them, look, there are 75,000 people who've signed this petition not to deport him. There are 138 MPs and MSPs who are backing, who have signed this open letter not to deport him. There are countless media celebrities and high profile people, as well as the public, who are all saying, don't deport him. Don't deport him. So she had asked for a meeting with Caroline Noakes, the immigration minister. That meeting happened on Tuesday evening, around five o'clock. They spoke for an hour and a half. What I've been told is that at the end of that meeting, at which also present were Keith Vaz MP, who is a Labour MP, and Sir Peter Bottomley MP, who is a Conservative MP. So a cross-party group of parliamentarians speaking to Caroline Noakes on my behalf, saying, look, he has a contribution to make. He has been redeemed. He has, um, uh, he, he is remorseful. You've served your time. I've served your, he served his time. He's not a criminal anymore. Why are we deporting him? Let's not deport him. This is literally the argument that they were making to Caroline Noakes. On top of that, we had prepared a document that showed that the Home Office has broken the law over 85 times in this process in the effort to deport me. It's so hard to deport someone, then, or even though they can make the rules themselves, they still have to break their own rules in order to achieve a deportation. So Hannah Bardell went and showed them, look, these are all the times that the Home Office has manipulated the process unlawfully to achieve this deportation. You need to consider this again. Now what I'm told is that Caroline Noakes went away and said to her before she went, look, you've done a really great job of making his case. I'm going to go away and reflect. Unfortunately, we don't know why. As well as that, Caroline Noakes said, in any event, the deportation is not necessarily imminent, right? So she, And this is the immigration minister. This is the minister for immigration. And she's basically saying, look, we're going to consider it properly. It's not going to happen that soon anyway. That's the message that came back to us on Tuesday evening. On Wednesday morning, I spoke to Hannah Bardell myself. And she called and she said, look, um, we've received a letter. The letter was written last night just one hour after the meeting. It's that's, very, that's strange. Very strange. It's because you hear the minister saying one thing, mm -hmm. and then this letter also communicates something. Else. Correct. And it suggests that the minister, I mean, this thing is all clearly, the deportation must have been in hand. They must have already made the preparations in order for me to be able to get on a flight. So they the probably were just telling you something. Well, we don't know. Perhaps she was just telling us something, or perhaps what happened was she put a call into whoever it is that she needs to call, whether it's Sajid Javid or Theresa May. You know they're going through this turmoil over Brexit right now, but who knows who she called, but she must have called someone and gone, you know what, actually maybe we need to look at this. Either that or yes, she was lying. We don't really know. All right. But either way, within one hour of the meeting, after all that information had been shared, a letter was written saying, sorry, he's got to go. We've assessed our decision and we are satisfied that the UK Home Office has made the right decision to deport Quaker. I had this call with Hannah at 10 o'clock. I was speaking to my lawyer around 1 o'clock. So at 1 o'clock, they lock you back in yourself. I was speaking to my lawyer. All of a sudden, boom, boom, door knocks. They open the door. Six people rush into the room with a camera. Mr. Adaboli, pack your things. You're being removed from the UK. Boom, just like that. So I was like, Jackie, I think it's happening right now. I'm just going to hang up the call. Okay, so I hang up the call. I say, what do you need me to do? They say, you need to pack your things. So I say, okay, can you tell me flight details? I need to know where we're traveling from, where we're traveling to, when I will arrive in Ghana. What is the route? And on what document are you, are you transferring me? You don't yeah. have my passport. 
So on what document are you, are you transporting me? The people in the room said, we don't know. We're going to hand you over to the transfer team. They will tell you. Okay, so I pack my stuff, put my bag, get marched out by these six people, one of them with the camera, reminding me not to be violent the whole time. Because if you use force, we will use force. That's what they keep telling you. So it's a very violent process. We arrive at the people, the men who are now going to carry me on the plane right. and, and across. And I get handed over to them. Again, I ask them, what's the route? What travel document? When will I arrive in Ghana? We don't have that information. As soon as we do know, we will tell you. They search me. I sign. The only document I sign is a document for my particulars, my, 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 my valuables and my property that's with the detention center. With the detention center. So I sign this document to hand it over. Then they put me in a van. There's like eight people in the van, right? Just for little of me. And we drive. You're not so little. Like <laughs> okay, maybe not so little. But yeah, maybe that's what they were scared of. Who knows? Anyway, um, we get to the security in Heathrow. It's a special security area. Um, I, uh, I think four or five security people search my, my, my baggage and my clothes, strip search, etc. It's really, really undignified. <laughs> yeah, really, really demoralizing. And um, it's a process, I think, that's designed to show you who you are. You're not worthy of being part of this country. And literally just taking away all your dignity. It was just mortifying. Remember, even by this point, nobody knows what's happening apart from Jackie. I've not been able to call anyone. And especially, I mean, your family, if you're being deported, they should be at the airport at least to receive you. Well, definitely my family here in Ghana need to be ready so that they, they can come and meet me. So I need to tell them. Plus, remember, they're worried too. They're thinking about what's happening too. And my family in the UK, my partner, my friends, etc., they also need to be able to travel and, 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 and understand conceptually what's happening. You know, human beings, we need to know what's happening to each other, even if we're separated by distance. We need to be able to conceptualize each other. So if I'm not able to share with you the information of what's happening to me, your anxiety about it goes up. Okay? So this is what's going on. The whole time I'm asking them, give me some information so I can give to my lawyers and my friends and my family. Nothing. We don't have that information. After security, we get back in the van. They drive to Heathrow. We drive around Heathrow, past Terminal 5, past Terminal 4, get to the actual tarmac where the airplanes are, and they park in between two planes. Kuwaiti Airlines on one side, Royal Air Maroc on the other side. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I mean, it was a beautiful evening. The sun was setting. I was like, oh, what a day to leave the UK. You know, this was going through my mind. My heart is really heavy. Um, and the Kuwaiti Airlines plane goes. So, okay. I, so, I, so I assume now they must be taking me on the on Royal the Air Maroc. Air Maroc. So, I, so I say, listen, come on. Let me call someone and tell them what's happening because they're worried. So I call Pippa, I call Alice, and I call my lawyer and I say, look. Did you have your phone or you had so, to request for your so, phone? So I had to request for my phone. They confiscated my phone. So I, I was like, please, listen. We've now been going through this process for three hours or so. Please give me my phone so I can call. So I call them and I say, this is what is happening. And I tell Pippa, look, we're sat on the tarmac next to Royal Air Maroc, so maybe that's the flight. And so she goes online and checks the leaving, the departure time of Royal Air Maroc. And it turns out that that's leaving at 10 past 5, and there's a connection through Casablanca to a crowd that arrives at 2.20 on uh, 2.20 a.m. on Thursday morning. That's the idea. So Pips is like, well, that kind of makes sense. It must be that. Okay, so probably that's how come we got the information, initial information was that you were coming on board on Air Maroc. Correct. And then all of a sudden, they come in and they go, you can't use your phone anymore. Give us your phone. We're confiscating it because the information you're, we've given, the, the information that you've told your friends has now reached social media and the media in general. All right. Therefore, it's endangering the flight. We're taking the phone from you. 
So they take the phone from me, and then as soon as they take the phone, they say, right, we're on the move. Close the door, put your seatbelt on, and then we drive around the airport. So you, you leave the We leave Air the Maroc. Royal Air Maroc. We go to the Kenya Airways flight and park next to the Kenya Airways flight. And suddenly I realized what they'd done was basically used me to get the information out misinformation ah, about the Royal Air Maroc yes. and then they take you on correct another. so they wanted to give misinformation and divert attention correct it seems that they were worried they were so ashamed in a sense of what they were doing they were worried that the protest would reach the airplane and they wouldn't be able to remove me right so they used misinformation they used me to trick the world because they knew I would tell my friends and family yeah right so they were so, even at that moment, they were so obsessed with policy and practice that they forgot that there is a human being that is being deported, and that is a violent process, and that human being is connected to hundreds, if not thousands, of other human beings all over the world. Right? They are so obsessed. The UK Home Office is a rogue institution. It is so obsessed with achieving policy and practice goals that it has completely forgotten that About there are the human rights beings. of the individual. Completely forgotten that there are human beings involved in this process. Correct. It is unbelievably inhumane. Okay. So they get you onto the plane. So to get you on the plane, what they do is they you know, take off your seatbelt, get out the plane, and then remember there's five at this point there's five guards that are escorting you. Five people are going to escort you halfway around the world. So one of them, it's very, very physical. These are big people. <laughs> one of them grabs one arm like this. The other one grabs the other hand. And one comes from behind, puts his hand just in the small of your back. They squeeze into you. Then they march you up the back steps. So everyone has entered the front of the plane through the gangway. I get marched up very, very fast up the back of the plane into the boom, into the back of the plane. And then the two back rows in the center are for us. So they stick me in the middle of three. One man stands to my right, another man stands to my left, three across the front. There's a lady involved as well. So the, the other three stand in front. So now they're creating a shield so no one can see me. And I'm saying to them, listen, you need to let me call my lawyers. You need to let me call my parents. You need to let me call my girlfriend because they don't know what's happening. They don't know that I'm getting this Kenya Airways flight. The flight is about to go, tell me. They're like, don't worry, we'll let you call, we'll let you call. So at this point, I started to become very, very anxious, really agitated, because effectively, all I wanted to do was say goodbye, to say, just look, I'm sorry. I mean, I know the plane is about to go in five minutes. I just want to say goodbye. But they wouldn't let me. And I was like, I need to tell my dad because he needs to prepare to come and meet me. Please, let me use the phone. So my voice starts to rise okay. and I start to get quite loud. The other passengers start to look. And at this moment, they realize if they don't give me the phone, it's going to become a problem. So they give me the phone and they say, okay, call your dad. It's five minutes before the plane goes. So I call my dad really quickly. I'm sorry, dad. The plane is about to leave. Um, we're going via Kenya Airlines. Uh, we'll arrive in Accra about, you know, quarter to 11 on Thursday in the morning. So these guys, these five guys are with you on the plane? Yes, so five people, one man, sorry, one woman, four men. Um, they sit with me the whole way, all Nairobi. the way to Nairobi. We change, they get on the flight from Nairobi to Accra, they fly to Accra, they get me to Accra, and then that's where they leave me. But five people, five people to transport one human being, like a piece of cargo. And their job is literally to show you physically that at no stage should you try and interfere with this process. Before we got on the plane, they came in and they said, listen, this information that we gave you got onto social media. Are you preparing to be violent on the plane? Are you preparing to disrupt the flight? Because let us warn you, the pilot has agreed no matter what happens, he's going to take you. And I said, look, I'm not a violent person. I've never been violent in my life. So then they said, well, are you going to be vocal? Because if you're, if you're vocal, that's still causing a disruption. We will be forced to use force. I was like, listen, 
I just want to get home in a dignified way. That's why I offered to leave myself once the legal process was done. You actually offered to leave? We offered, we offered the Home Office. We said to them, look, once the legal process is complete, if it is not successful, we are happy to, I'll buy my own ticket, I'll get on a plane and I will fly myself because I do not want this undignified exit. Give us more time and we will, I will fly myself. I'll say goodbye properly and I'll fly myself. Literally, I told them that in an email. My lawyer told them that in an email. I even said it on the radio last Saturday. And yet they wanted to have this happen on that day. I don't know why, but they forced it. So what happened was because of what they'd done to misinform us about the flight and because I was constantly asking for the details of the flight but not getting it, I started to mistrust them. So for the first two hours of the flight, I just sat there crying, 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 crying because I hadn't been able to speak properly to anyone, just crying. And then luckily, luckily, this is completely by fluke. There was a delegation of MPs traveling to Nairobi to do a three-day um, uh, uh, um, piece of analysis on migration and, um, and uh, um, the uh, environmental change and the economy in both Nairobi and in, um, in Ethiopia. So one of those was an S&P MP, a guy called Chris Law, who is friends with Hannah Bardell, my MP. So somehow they got a message to Chris that I was on the same plane and he got in touch with the detention, the escorts, these bounty hunters. My girlfriend calls them bounty hunters. <laughs> um, he got a message to them through the, the, the staff and eventually, around four hours into the flight, he came and we, we stood, I stood with him in the back of the plane and we talked for about two hours. And it was that moment where I started to feel like a human being again. So now I feel like a human. I'm speaking to someone about issues that I think are important for all of us. He's being just so kind and so human and saying he disagrees with the process and reminding me that even though I'm being sent to Ghana, there's work that we can all do together between the global south and the west. All right. And he gave me his contact and he said, when you get to Ghana, get in touch. Let's figure out what we do next. So at this point, the, 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 the escort. escort staff are standing across the gangway watching the whole time. They're not interfering, they're just watching. And obviously they can tell. If I can stand there and, with an MP and just talk for two hours, then I'm obviously not going to be a disruption. And at that point, we start to rebuild trust. trust. So at this point, we start to talk. And through the talking, I got to know that the leader of this group of men actually was originally a Ghanaian. To be fair to them, they said, look, we're sorry that we had to do it this way. We were worried about the media. We were just doing a job. I understand that, but it's still wrong, to be fair. Nevertheless, we go into a conversation. And that's how I found out he's from yeah. Ghana originally. So you arrive at the Kotoka International Airport and then what yeah. happens? So I arrive, I get picked up by um, immigration staff, Ghana Immigration and CID. They take me to the police headquarters. We do some, they ask me some questions. I fill in some forms. They, say, they, they tell me, oh, this is just process. I fill in some forms. Then I start to get agitated, right? Because I just want to go home. I just want to see my parents my sisters, my family. I just want to, it's been such a vibe. So it means your dad couldn't welcome you at the so, airport? No, because they took me in a car around the back, away from the airport, straight to CID. So I'm now calling my dad and a friend um, from university who also lives here, works here. And um, were, you, were you using your UK phone? or your I was using my UK phone. phone. I spent okay. 60 pounds in like two hours. I know. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Because of course, when I turned my phone on, there were like 3,000 WhatsApp messages. Because right. everyone, everyone had been going crazy, like Quake, is everything okay? Messages going back and forth. So anyway, I called my dad and I was like, this is where I am. And now he came. So slowly, slowly, everyone came 
to CID. My dad met me there. Alex met me there. My mum met me there. Luckily, they came there. Because if they hadn't come, I suspect I would have spent many hours there. But because everyone came there, they, they had to let, let you go. go. Yeah. So now, you've been taking out, um, your parents have taken you from the police CID and brought you home. Mm. And then we saw these images of you uh, on social media <laughs> with uh, some, a dish Mm. in front of you. Mm. What, what food was that? Banku? It was Banku or? and uh, palm nut soup. Okay, that was quite a welcome actually. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? Um, you know, it's good to be home, I have to say. Um, you know, a lot of people have commented that in the fight not to be deported, they have assumed, perhaps, I think, the media all around the world, but also in Ghana, has just assumed somehow that because I was fighting not to be deported from the UK, that I didn't have a home here. Of course I have a home here. Well, there were headlines that went out that mm. you were fighting not to return to Ghana mm. uh, because you said being in, uh, you're, you're better off in, in prison UK, in the UK. Yeah, in, in the UK, in prison in, in the UK than being here in Ghana, and uh, people didn't quite take kindly to it. It's, yeah. it's, it's I mean, and I've read the article, the article that has that as the headline, which then propagated. When you read the body, the message in, the, in that article, it doesn't support the headline. Because what I actually said was, it is, it is worse to be deported from the UK than it is to be in prison in the UK. It's the deportation from the UK. It's never had anything to do with Ghana, Ghana at all. I've consistently said, and go and read it in The Guardian, etc. I've consistently said, nobody in my position should be forced to choose between the two pillars of their heritage. I'm a proud Ghanaian, but really, even though I don't have a passport, I'm a proud British man as well. Why? Because I grew up there as a child, but I was born in Ghana. Nobody should have to choose between the two, because the two are central to my identity. That's what I was trying to protect. I was trying to protect my British part of my identity, not to reject Ghana. I love Ghana. Ghana is home too. Nobody should have to choose between the two. Unfortunately, that message has gone out there and people are going to judge you by that. This, they're they're going to say, if this guy didn't want to be in Ghana or was fighting so hard not to be in Ghana, we don't want him in Ghana. Yeah. You see, what people don't understand about the deportation process is that once you're deported, from one of the G20 nations, or anywhere in the West, pretty much, you can't be returned. You can't return to that country for 10 years, minimum. On top of that, you then have to apply to go back. But the terms, the test to decide whether you can go back is the same test they do to decide whether they should deport you. So once they've deported you, actually, you're never going back. But even worse, once you're deported from one of the G20 nations, because of information sharing between all of them, you can't return to any of them. So basically, because I've been deported, I can't go to Europe, I can't go to America, I can't go to Japan, I definitely can't go to the UK. Now, I've been trying to make the argument that the experience that I've gone through, the lessons that I've learned, put me in a place where I am duty bound to try and use those lessons to do good to add value to the community, both in the UK and in Ghana. That's what I've been saying, actually. But that in order for me to be valuable to Ghana as well, I need to protect my ability to remain in the UK too. Why? We live in a global world. We work together. In the, in the coming decades, the challenges the world is going to face due to uh, global um, climate change, migration challenges, etc., we are going to need to work together between the global south and the west. We need to work together to solve these problems. As someone who has seen the finance industry from the place that I saw it, who has gone through the UK criminal justice system, and who has now, ex who has now learned firsthand about our migration policies on a global level, I'm in a position where I can help to share the lessons, to try and find solutions to the problems that the West thinks it has with migration and that the Global South has 
with climate change, right? That is the challenge we face going into the next 20, 30, 40 years. I think that's something I can contribute. But yeah. having been deported from the UK, it's really it's difficult. very difficult to You do. argue out your case so beautifully and uh, so convincingly. But I'm trying to reconcile the image I saw on social media mm. with you being served a local dish mm. and you looking so downhearted and sorrowful. Mm. And I'm like, all right, clearly this is a man who's not happy. Mm. Is it that he's not happy that he's in Ghana? And does that then feed into the narrative, which was you really didn't want to come to Ghana? Absolutely not. And, you know, I reject that completely. You know, the deportation process itself is extremely violent. It's so violent. When I arrived here, I was overwhelmed with emotion. I mean, I still am now. Just overwhelmed. And I came home, and my family was here. There were about 30 people. And they came to welcome me home. Although it is heartbreaking to have been deported from the UK, my old home, and although I'm still fighting to, main, to get that back as well as here, there is nothing more humbling than coming home to your family and realizing that they also must celebrate the moment that you come home. Because it is the first time in seven years, in seven years, that I am free. And because I am free, they are free too. And now those pictures were never meant to go out. There was a private moment. I was just so humbled to be home. So again, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just so difficult because when you contrast the welcome of Ghana, against the violence and the draconian policy of the UK in sending me here in the way that they did. Those pictures reflect what it does to a human being to be deported violently in the way that I was. Okay, let's take a break at this moment. Uh, we'll come back and continue speaking with Kweku. I and my friends in the UK, my family in the UK, have been fighting this thing for seven years. You become desensitized, right? You, just, you, you become desensitized to the UBS manipulation in the court. Okay, look, let me just say this straight out. I don't think I'm a victim of anything, right? I was a banker, there was a loss on my trading desk, but I didn't have an intent to make a personal gain. I was just trying to do my job as well as I could for the bank, as were my colleagues, actually. We were trying our best. We weren't actually trying to defraud the bank in any way. We were just trying to run a very complex trading book and achieve the very difficult goals we were being set. And we failed. When we failed, someone had to take responsibility. We talked. Nobody wanted to do it. But because of the way I've been brought up, you're supposed to stand up, you're supposed to take responsibility, you're supposed to do the right thing. I stood up, I sent an email. I said, look, I'll take responsibility. You guys carry on running this book. That was the agreement, right? Since you brought it up, let's go back to it. Mm -hmm. How much money was involved? So the bank, we were running a $50 billion book. $50 billion. $50 billion. So it's at times just two traders. At time, by the time of 2011, there were four traders, two seniors, two juniors. We weren't that senior though. You know, we only had four years experience. And you were handling that book? Just that trading book? Two of us, yes. Two of you? Yeah. And under what circumstances did you come to find yourself in that position? So I had been in the bank for three years as an operations analyst. I had been brought onto the book in 2006 as a junior. I had no experience of trading whatsoever. The purpose was, the goal was learn on the job as you go. So you're just learning from your colleagues. I was the third person to join the desk. 
In 2007, 10 months after I joined the desk, my boss left. He had built the book from scratch. And the bank had a choice to replace him or to leave myself and the guy who became my supervisor to run the book. So just two of us running $50 billion of risk into the financial crisis. The purpose of the book was to take the risk of our clients and internalize them in the bank in order to protect our clients and then to trade proprietary risk, to use the bank's money to make profits, to cover the cost of running these positions for the clients. Sounds all very complicated to yes. me, and I'm sure it's going to be very complicated to the people who yes. are watching. So if you just break it down for In us. In very simple terms, our job was to take risk from our clients. So your clients have risks. They have a position, they have exposures, etc. And they just want to protect themselves going into the financial crisis. So they come to us to get that protection. Okay. So you, you buy it, the risk off them? We effectively buy the risk, one kind of risk off them, and then sell another kind of risk to, to offset the, the, the different positions. Okay, so you've got different types of positions, basically. But the point is that it sounds complicated because it really was very, very complicated. There were 4,000 different instruments on the book, every different asset class you can think of being traded by two guys, right? At the time, I was 27, he was 25, and we were going into the financial crisis, the biggest financial crisis the world has ever seen. We, at that point, mm. had we anticipated, or had you anticipated, mm. or do you anticipate that we are going into a financial crisis? Uh, we knew in late 2007, so by summer of 2007, we knew. The rest of the world didn't really wake up to it until September of 2008, okay. so a year later, but we knew in 2007. In fact, actually, we knew in March of 2007. Essentially, UBS knew, and they're into the business of taking risks. Yes. And so they were making money off those risks. Yes, and you know, to some extent, I mean, to be true, UBS actually ended up losing $60 billion through the financial crisis, through subprime and other bad assets. Because they burnt their fingers. They were in there to make money. Yes. but. They lost sixty billion dollars in the process. This was well before. If it had gone well, they probably would have made a lot more money. Yes, indeed. Um, but that's the business they were in. Sixty billion dollars was lost. We went to the Swiss taxpayers. They bailed us out. Then the pressure came on us to repay the Swiss taxpayers as quickly as possible by generating as much profit as we could as quickly as possible. Since our trading book was the biggest in the bank, the pressure came on us to generate that profit for, to repay the Swiss taxpayers and then to rebuild the bank as fast as possible. By 2011, we survived the crisis, by the way, Spick and Span generated, um, you know, year after year of profits for the bank. Um, but to do it, we designed a system called the umbrella and ultimately the umbrella was later called um, unlawful. But at the time, our, the team knew about it, our bosses knew about it. It was legit. Our operations staff about knew more. about it. Everybody was happy with the process because it was generating profits. We were open about it. And you know, effectively, what I said during my trial is, you don't think something is dishonest if everybody knows about it, regardless. Despite all of that, in 2011, after an incredible start to the year where we generated $130 million in the first six years, sorry, six months of the year, we then made a series of very bad decisions. We panicked, we um, lost control, primarily because we were working 20 hours a day for years on end and we were really tired and just lost clarity of mind and control. Not out of criminality, not because we wanted to enrich ourselves, but because we were trying to reach the very difficult goals that it were set It was overwhelming. Apart and uh, you were under pressure. Correct. Can you talk about the umbrella? Yes. What? Who came up with that idea? So my, my, my manager and I came up with that idea. Um, and the idea... The one who eventually left? Um, no, not him. The supervisor that took over from him, okay. he named it the umbrella. And the idea behind the process was we needed to find... It was like a savings account. We needed to find a way to... Um, uh, 
offset the losses that were having, happening in the parts of the book that we didn't understand. Remember, mm -hmm. this is a very complex book and we didn't understand all of it and we were really inexperienced. So the bits that we understood, we needed to generate profits in that part in order to offset losses in the bits we did not understand. That was the idea. Okay. Nevertheless, we used the umbrella in order to pursue the extra profit goals that we were being set. And as a result, when 2011, in the summer of 2011, when the market crashed, we panicked, we lost control, we made a series of terrible mistakes, and we ended up losing $2.3 billion. If you had not panicked, if you still had your, um, if you still had control of mm, the situation. Decision making, yes. You would have been different. Yeah, and so actually there's a part of the story um, that often doesn't get told, right? Which is that in June, a month before the losses began, I had been sending emails to my bosses saying, look, I think the market is going to crash, right? We need to prepare ourselves. There's countless emails were shown during the trial of me saying, look, I don't understand why we're trying so hard to trade as if the market is going to be safe, sound, and secure. Okay. I think it's going to crash. So you saw the market going in one direction. I thought it was going to crash, yeah. And, uh, but the whole UBS was moving in another direction. Correct. The, 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 uh, the most of the rest of the bank, led by a piece of research that had come out of um, our research team, was expecting that um, things were going to pick up. Things were going to pick up, and so because I was sending my emails to increasingly more senior people, saying, "Look, I think the market is going to crash," increasingly more senior people were coming to my desk saying, "You're wrong." So eventually, the CEO of the bank himself came to the desk and said, "Kweku," said to myself and some others, "Kweku, I know in front of others, I know you think the market is going to crash. You need to know why we think the market's not going to crash." And he literally said to us. Axel Weber, one of the former governors of the ECB, the European Central Bank, who's moving to become the chairman of UBS, has told us in the interview process that the European Central Bank is going to take a number of actions that's going to cause the market to go up hard. Okay. The problem is, he was a year too soon. They didn't actually take that action until the summer of 2012. It was what Mario Draghi, the ECB chairman said, called, whatever it takes, we will do whatever it takes. Anyway, quantitative easing is the answer. Fiscal and monetary expansion, basically, is the answer. So because Karsten came to my desk and told me this, I was like, well, if the CEO of the bank himself yeah. has told me, <laughs> it'd be crazy for me to do the opposite. So we did the trades as if the market was going to rally. Unfortunately, the very day that we changed our positions to match what he was asking us to do, the market crashed, 40%. And be, I guess is the process by which we came to the decision. Because I'd been pushing so hard, because it became a big argument, and then because of the entropy level we had to go through to change our decision, we were like, well, the CEO has told us, so we need to protect the position. Keep backing it, keep backing it, keep backing it. The market kept falling and falling and then it gets too big and then you get desperate and you panic and you buy more. You go to your boss, he says, buy it, buy more or hold. And then eventually, one day we came in, the market was down 10% and we just closed the positions. We realized that we'd lost control, the positions were too big and we'd lost $2.3 billion. So it didn't just happen. It, it there were a lot of processes. You went through a lot of processes before eventually you got to this point. There was a number of processes. So the loss itself took six weeks. From the moment the loss began to the moment it crystallized was six weeks. So July the 1st, August the 13th, about six weeks. Yeah. We spent another four weeks trying to resolve the loss. And then September the 14th, after a meeting on the 12th, I send the email and I take responsibility for it. You say that you took responsibility because of your upbringing. What sort of upbringing was that? Well, when I say I take responsibility, I think 
again, I am often criticized about this. People say, well, you didn't take responsibility because you didn't plead guilty at your trial. But they don't realize that the reason I pled not guilty was A, because I thought it was important that people would know exactly how it happened and why. You know, the reason I'm able to tell you what I'm telling you now is because it was disclosed during the trial. If I wasn't able to tell you, if I hadn't gone to trial, we would never have this conversation. It wouldn't be public knowledge. Because you have sworn an oath of secrecy. Well, because, and because if it's not made public during the trial, then if you try and say something, the bank will come after what you say, right? Remember, no one ever criticizes me for what I say about what happened. No one's going to come after me because I've told you this, because it's already in the public domain, mm -hmm. right? So what I felt was I needed to plead not guilty in order to get the disclosure, in order to tell the lessons and to explain exactly how this thing happened, in order to protect other junior traders, but also the system so that we could lead to change. When I talk about my upbringing, I'm talking about the fact that when my parents moved us to Israel, the thing they always told us was, I was the oldest, I've got three sisters. The thing they always told me was, you have to look after your sisters and your mom. But also you have to look after your cousins and your family back in Ghana because you're the lucky one. You've been given this opportunity. So you have a responsibility backwards to them. Then I went to a Quaker boarding school at the age of 12 because they sent me to boarding school in Yorkshire, in, in England. And the motto of the school is non sibi set omnibus, not for self, but for all. The community is more important than the individual. As an individual, you have to meet your responsibilities to the community in order to earn your place in the community, right? So as a banker at UBS, you're trying to generate the profits that the bank is asking you to generate because it's your responsibility to the community. But then when it goes wrong, you also have to take that responsibility, again, to protect the community. That was the thinking. Slightly flawed, perhaps naive, to believe that those values would protect you in a bank, especially in the UK, in the, um, in the city in, in, in the UK at that time um, during the financial crisis. But that's what we felt. I felt that was my responsibility, right? And again, that, I think that comes from the way I was brought up. Would you have done, if you had the opportunity, would you have done things differently? Yeah, so I, I always get that. Would you have still admitted or accepted responsibility? Oh, that's a much tougher question. Right, so I'll, I'll answer the easy version first. I mean, people always ask me, what would you have done differently? I think what I would have done differently is go back to this 27-year-old me and say, look, you need to have the courage of your convictions. You have to believe in your idealism. And you need to recognize that you're the one who can see. That's why they've put you there. So you need to have the courage to go back to them and say, what you're asking us to do is impossible or is really, really difficult. So if you want us to keep doing it, give us more resources, give us more people, give us more technology, give us more leadership. That's what I would do. And I would go back and I would say that. Otherwise, we're going to fail. And your boss, who had come to tell you that the bank believes, based on the information they had from the ECB, yeah. um, that we, you feel this way, mm. but we feel that way. Correct. What do you have told him? So I would have said to him, look, I'm looking at the market day in, day out. You know, my job is to try and assess what everyone in the market is doing based on the individual actions of the individual traders that I can see. And based on what I can see, regardless of what the ECB is going to do, I think the market's going to crash. You know, there are emails that I sent saying, look, I would rather make money that everyone can benefit from in the bank than follow the crowd and fall off the edge of the cliff like a lemming. To my friends, my colleagues, etc. I should have had the courage of my convictions and said, look, I just, I'm sorry, you're not sitting where I'm sitting. What I can see, I just think you're wrong. The others too who say that, here's this young man who found himself managing this trading book, $50 billion, and uh, you're also making some money off it. 
quite a bit of money. I mean, you had well, a, a good life. Well, I mean, a very good life. Look, we can talk about how much I was getting paid all day long. Bankers get paid well. But the really important thing for me to highlight is that I wasn't driven by money. It, it's, it's, it's really important for me to, to explain that the reason I was found not guilty of the four, four of the six charges I faced was because the jury could clearly see that none of these decisions were driven by an intent for gain, for personal gain. Yes, I was being paid really well, but this is part of the narrative, the caricature that's painted to separate me from you. Just because I was being paid really well, you need to not like me, right? The focus on how much I was getting paid is simply part of the process of separating you from me. But just because I was getting paid well doesn't mean it was a good life. We were working 20 hours a day. All we did was work. There was no time to enjoy the money at all. Oh, there was no time to enjoy there was the money? No, there was no time. There was no, there was no collection of artifacts. In fact, over 250,000 pounds of my salary was in UBS shares. When the loss happened, all got taken away. Never earned it. Never, never, never came to me, actually. Right? Um, the other thing that's really important is the UK press always focuses on my salary, always, but they don't tell you the trajectory. It went like this. In the last year, the six months before I was arrested, that was when the salary was really high. The previous year, it was half that. The year before that, it was half again. So that two years before I was arrested, it's still a very, very good salary. I was earning £50,000 plus a £20,000 bonus. It's still a very good salary, of course, I know. But this idea that I was earning so much money, they try and make it look as if I was earning that money for a really long period of time. It was just the last year where it went like that. So again, I recognize it's a lot of money, it's a very good salary. But this had nothing to do with money. Just because the product of your work is money doesn't mean that the motivation is money. So now you've been to jail and, and back, and you have this ex-con tag. Yes. Following you. How well, do you feel about that? Well, so, here, this is a really important question. You know, when the Home Secretary in the UK, Sajid Javid, said I needed to be deported, what he said was, the Home Office is determined to deport foreign national criminals who have abused the UK's hospitality and committed offences. What we've been telling him, what we've been trying to tell him for years now, is that someone who comes to the UK as a child, how can that person still be a guest 26 years later? How can they still be a guest abusing hospitality? Because of this policy, You've kindly said, I've got this ex-convict tag. Because of this policy, what the UK has done is said that I am never to be redeemed. Never. You never get redeemed. You will always be a foreign national criminal. Now, let's be realistic. I went to prison for three and a half years. I spent three and a half years doing everything I could to contribute back. I spoke to 7,000 students, six formers, professionals, risk managers, even the UK Army itself, teaching from the lessons we learned. I did that because I think it's the right thing to do. It's the responsibility you have to teach from the lessons you learn. So the label is just a label. I have, I've had to do a lot of work with offender managers and supervisors back in the UK, probation officers, who spent a lot of effort saying to me, telling me, listen, Kwaku, you are not a criminal. You made a mistake, some bad decisions, but they weren't driven by criminality. You need to shed yourself of this label. Do you think you've done that effectively, shed that label? Um, Unfortunately, the UK government has done absolutely everything in its power using the immigration tribunals, using the Home Office deportation process, even using the media such as the BBC to maintain the label till the very end. 
And that process of manipulation, we've already talked about it, did not end with them saying, finally, you have to be deported. It ended through even the removal process, the manipulation and the labeling. The work they've done to make that label stick is incredible. But it is because of the abuses of process that they've gone through to do that, that there is still an army of people back in the UK who refuse to give up the fight, this whole keep Kwaku fight, don't deport him, is because they recognize the truth. I am rehabilitated, but the government is trying to maintain that position in order to justify a hostile environment policy, which must not continue. Now, back in Ghana, we've had our own issues with the uh, banking sector. Mm. Um, seven banks have gone down mm -hmm. in the last year. Mm -hmm. And the people who are clamoring for the people who are the helm of affairs yeah. to be prosecuted, some are actually calling for them to be jailed. Now, we look on social media. I look on social media in the past um, 24 hours since your photos, photos of you having this huge local dish in front of you and a bottle of beer. Mm. And people saying, we welcome you. The reception has been quite warm. Yes. People have been quite receptive. But there are others too who say, why is it that Ghanaians in one breath were saying or are saying, let's jail the people who were responsible for the bank collapse? And yet, they're so receptive of Kweku. Well, there's two parts to that process, isn't there? Right? In life, people fail. People make mistakes. People often even commit criminal acts. But that is part of the human condition. Once someone has failed, once they have paid their dues, actually, a fair and just society expects, expects that that person is allowed to return to society. If we have a society where anyone in that society cannot be redeemed, then it is a society that is unjust. It is any, any society that does not give second chances fairly, I must add, is a society that is unjust. So I suspect, I'm not sure, but I suspect that one of the reasons that social media is saying, on one hand, we must punish, we must send a message for failure in the banking industry in Ghana is because they want the bankers to learn and to change so that it doesn't happen again. But once they learn and change, which is the journey I've been on, why keep punishing them? Because surely you benefit from the learn and change. So you're essentially saying they should also spend their time in jail? Well, if a court like of you, you their did. peers decides that that is the right way for it to go, then you can't, you can't question it. Remember, I said, I'm not a victim. I'm, I've never said I'm a victim, right? Rightly or wrongly, I was asked to go to prison. I held my head high. I went to prison. I served my time. I did it in a way to make sure that I could use the lessons for good. Granted, that's used against me. They say, oh, you didn't expect to accept your responsibility. But in truth, I did. And the way in which I've conducted myself is so that you can bring back the lessons of change, right? And I think, I suspect, those who are commenting on social media saying, why are we still vilifying Kwaku, are saying it because at a certain point, when you can see the effort that someone is making to make amends and to contribute back, it becomes unfair. And that's why Tens of thousands of people in the UK are still fighting, saying this deportation from the UK is unjust because they know full well that I'm rehabilitated, I'm trying to do my best, I will never re-offend. They know that. But when, when you know, bankers in Ghana who have failed, or anywhere else have failed, if the right thing to do is to find them criminal li criminally liable in a fair and just way, then do that, but don't vilify them forever. You need to give them a chance to come back. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, when a child falls, you tell them, get up, learn from it, don't fall again, or run faster, but run better. 
Those are the lessons we give children. How much more grown-ups too? How can you be of use to Ghana? What is it that you've learned? What are some of the experiences? When I was released from prison, I set off on a mission and all I wanted to do was, you know, have do lectures with sixth formers and um, university students. Right? That's really all I wanted to do because the Home Office was saying, you're not allowed to work. So I was like, okay, what can I do so that I'm not breaking the rules, but I'm still productive, yeah. right? So I started off talking to six formers. Then all of a sudden, I was being asked to speak at conferences. So I started speaking at conferences. Then I start working with Barclays Bank, the UK Special Forces, uh, the Bank of England. Um, the Bank uh, of England? The Bank of England. Even the Home Office itself. How to learn from failure. How to, how to manage risk in the grey zone. What kind of policy changes do we need to put in place to make sure that our institutions meet the social contract to the people? How do we make sure that our institutions are able to rebuild the trust which has failed since the financial crisis 10 years ago? Those are the conversations I've been having, and I've been having them with literally everyone at the top levels in the UK. Now, those contacts, those relationships are valuable because we live in a global society, yeah. right? The finance industry is centered in New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, and London, pretty much. There are other centers, but those are the main ones. In order for it to work, you need to be able to interact on a global scale. Ghana is part of that global scale, part of that global effort. We are a nation that's also trying to join the global group and do good things, create jobs for our young, create opportunities for growth. To do that, I think I can help by bringing together the people that I was working with in the UK with the people who are running these things in Ghana too, at a policy level, but also at the execution level, whether it's small investment banks, whether it's groups of traders, um, whether it's politicians who are looking for policy advice, etc. I think I can contribute to that too. It's a shame that I'm not allowed to travel back to the UK or to the West because obviously, like I say, it's a global platform, but I will do my best to impart the advice and the learnings that I've had on this journey. There are a lot of people who keep wondering, you were in the UK for so many years. Yeah. Why didn't you naturalize? Well, the naturalization thing is actually just procedural. So I started work in 2002 when I did my internship. UBS's immigration lawyers advised me that I should go down the work permit route, i.e. get a work permit, work five years under your work permit, get indefinite leave to remain, live under indefinite leave to remain for one year, then apply for a passport. What I didn't know was that in 2002, I'd already been in the UK for 10 years. There's this thing called the 10 year route. So I could have just applied for a passport then and then, All right. right? Or indefinite leave to remain and then a passport. But lawyers do as lawyers do. They realized that if I went down the route they were sending me, I'm sure they would get three bites of the cherry in terms of fees. And I, was, I didn't understand immigration rules, so I, was like, I just did what they asked me. Remember, this isn't about money. They were paying for the process. By 2009, I had my ILR for one year, and they called me and they said, look, it's time to get your passport. Send us your passport. I didn't even have to pay for it. Send us your passport. We'll send it to the office. We'll get you the passport back, and then you can go. So I said to them, how long will they have my passport for? And they said, oh, somewhere between six and nine months. I was like... I can't do that because I'm traveling for work at the drop of a hat all the time. You know, client is panicking in Frankfurt this morning. I'll get on a plane at lunchtime, have a meeting with him at three o'clock and fly back. I can't give you my passport for six to nine months. Because remember, there's only two of us on the desk. When things calm down, I'll send you my passport. This is 2009. Then two years later, working 20 hour days every day. I, it just wasn't able to do it because the process is just process. Just because I didn't want to be not able to do that part of my job, I didn't send the passport 
my Ghana passport to get the UK passport. I just, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting for a moment. It never came. And then the loss happened. Do you regret it? It would have saved a lot of heartache. You know, if I had gone through that last step of the process, none of this would have happened. All this pain and suffering for my family, for my UK friends and family, I bet you anything, even the Home Office, I bet even they wish, they wish that I just got the passport so they didn't have to go through the process that we've gone through. Because you know what, I think at the end, even they were ashamed. They were ashamed of the process. That's why they did it on the same day that they knew all the headlines in the UK would be about Brexit. So no one would be watching. Oh. <laughs> I think even they were ashamed. Because in the end, everybody knows what they've done is wrong. Everybody knows that they've had to manipulate like crazy to achieve it. Why? Because actually, when someone has lived somewhere for 26 years, and that person isn't a threat to the country, we all know deep down that deportation is the wrong thing to do. Unfortunately for them, so many people are watching that the noise is not dying down. And even though I'm not there, it has become a fight, a fight for a change in the policy. Because what we're saying is, those who were born in the UK or grew up here from an early age, they're not guests. They are part of you. You created them. They're British. So if something goes wrong, it's the Britishness in them that went wrong. It's not the Ghanaian in me that caused the crime. It's because I was a product of the financial system, the British financial system. So where is the morality in deporting someone to somewhere they left when they were four years old, as if that place is responsible for their behavior? It's not because I was born in Ghana that this thing happened. They know that it's wrong. And everyone, all the campaigners are fighting because they know if we don't get the policy changed so that those born in the UK or who grew up there from a young age can no longer routinely be deported, as Stephen Shaw asked in the review that was accepted by the Home Office on the 24th, the Home Secretary on the 24th of July, then it will be bad for the UK in terms of its moral integrity and in terms of the fiber of its community. So they are still fighting. How has your family taken all of this? Um, of course they've supported me um, because they understand what is actually at stake. The ability for me to continue to do the work I'm doing very much depends on whether or not I was deported. But at the same time, I think everyone is happy that well, as I've said a number of times, we are free for the first time. We are free. Did your, your dad, for instance, get to hear your side of the story or he read it in the headlines? Because if he read it in the headlines, it would have meant something different. Mm. My dad sat through the trial, the whole trial. I mean, the day you were arrested. He was in Ghana when I was arrested. Uh, he flew to the UK pretty much immediately. He came and visited me in prison. Did he get to hear of your arrest as in, did you have to tell him? Or no. he... He heard of my arrest through the news. Um, so I was, I had been arrested. I was in Bishopsgate Police Station. And my lawyer came in and rather flippantly just said, well, at least you're number one on global news. And I was like, oh my God, my parents. How's How that they, supposed to make anybody excited? You know, as if it's some drama. You know, it's like, again, this, this ability sometimes, I don't know whether it's because of the color of my skin, but this inability of people in the criminal justice system and an immigration system to see that I'm a human rather than just a banker or just a part of a machine. The inability to see, I think it's because they don't identify with me because of the color of my skin. We all agree that the UK criminal justice system is racist. Even my MP says that. We all agree, right? David Lamy, did an, uh, David Lamy MP, MP for Tottenham, did an analysis. The criminal justice system in the UK is racist. Even the Prime Minister herself said it. On the steps of Downing Street, she said, if you are black or working class white male, 
you are treated worse by the criminal justice system than anyone else, right? <laughs> so we know it's racist. So they don't identify. That's why they can say something flippantly like that and not realize that human beings like my mother and father are sitting in Ghana and the first they're going to know about this thing is on BBC News. And that must be heartbreaking for a parent, of course, heartbreaking. Did he tell you about it? I mean, what were the first, um, what, the, what, what sort of conversation did you have when you first met him? The or when he came over to see you? Uh, the, exactly the kind of conversation you'd expect between a father and a son. How are you? Oh, how are you? Are you okay? You're in prison. All he cares about is your well-being. Are you okay? Is everything all right? What happened? Are you safe? What happened? We have the conversation. Then the conversation moves to, okay, so what are you going to do? Guilty, not guilty? What's the pathway? And why? So the conversation eventually gets to, okay, I'm going to plead not guilty for these reasons, the reasons I've already said. And then, okay, well, whatever you decide, we are behind you. So this is the same for my friends as well as my parents. And then he had the burden is the only way I can put it, of sitting through the trial and watching the way in which things were said, the way in which the trial was conducted, the ridiculous things that were said by the prosecutor. But at the end, I think we just all accepted, you know, it was okay, this happened. You've tried to deal with it with dignity by standing up and telling the truth and being open completely when everyone else is not being open and generally are lying. But you have done the right thing. And so for that reason, I'm proud. That's all. Do you feel, or did you at any point in time feel let down by your employers, UBS? I feel that when... Um, they knew what really drove my, my decision-making and my character. They knew what kind of person I was. And they launched an operation to destroy my character because they knew that if they didn't do that, then my colleagues would come and stand up for me. Do you know, the day before I was deported, on Tuesday, I got an email from one of my former colleagues, one another trader on the FX desk, basically saying, I was going to give evidence, but the bosses realized what I might say and asked me not to. Now, we are bringing up stories of the past. My focus here is to look to the future. I think it's time now for us all to say, seven years is a long enough time no matter what happened or how it happened, it's time for us to look forward. And the way we look forward is we say, what can we learn from this journey? And what can I give now to Ghana? And how can I support those back in the UK who are still fighting? They are fighting both for me to be given back the right to be able to go to the UK, which is my other home, but also they are fighting for a change in the law. That is my focus. We've moved on now from the seven years. That, does it mean that you haven't quite given up on your deportation? Yes, I mean, we, we, I don't think we can. Although my focus is building my life here, I don't think we can because it's unjust and uh, the punishment that it represents will never go away but also because this is a really important moment for us to realize that the policies are wrong. Um, it's a moment where people are standing up. So many people in the UK, I mean, there was a letter written, an, e uh, an article written in The Guardian that came out today, I think, basically saying exactly what I was saying before. The Home Office statement of, those who abuse our hospitality. You can't say that about a child who grew up in the UK, who spent more than two thirds or whatever of his life. So 
the fight is not just about me. You know, what might happen is the policy will change, right? The people who have, who have been fighting with me will continue that fight and the policy will change, but I won't be included. If that's what happens, I think that that was worth it, right? My suffering will have led to a positive change. I might not benefit from it, but that's okay. All right. Have you ever been approached by um, any movie producer for you to maybe feature in a movie or use your story, <laughs> um, turn your story into a movie? I have um, been approached by script writers, ghost writers, literary agents, um, producers. We just haven't had the time or the energy to properly consider anything. Um, you know, we need to think about whether that is valuable um, and what's the best way to tell the story once and for all so that I can get on with my life. Right. I understand that that's necessary. Um, but I think now that, as I say, I'm free for the first time, <laughs> we can actually focus on how best to do that. I mean, so you're open to the idea of uh, turning your story into a movie? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think it's important, um, not because of its potential sensationalization or sensationalism, sorry, use my English properly, um, but because for posterity and so that I can move on. I can't carry on telling this story every day, you know, to groups of 100 or 200 or 300 people. I mean, I'm sure I will have to do that in one form or another, but it would be nice for the story to be told and then I can focus on actually trying to move life forward out of the hole, trying to contribute to what everyone else is trying to achieve. When I came to the UK, when I last met you, mm -hmm. in fact, the first time I met you, mm -hmm. I met your, your girlfriend at the detention center. How is she taking all of this? Um, so Alice has been a rock through this process. Her father is seriously ill with brain cancer. So we are going through, I mean, it's only been 24 hours, 28 hours since this thing happened. But we have this, um, we have a challenge, which is how do we balance her responsibilities to her father and helping with his care? and us finding a way to maintain our relationship. This is the true cost of the violence of deportation, is that real human relationships, it's never just the person, it's not about me, it's about me and Alice, and she is devastated. Yesterday, on the phone, for one and a half hours, she just cried. She couldn't breathe, just cried and cried. And there's nothing more devastating than watching your girlfriend crying and not being able to help. You can't hold them, you can't help them. It's just on a camera, what are you supposed to do? And I'm just saying to her, breathe, just breathe, it'll be okay, we'll find a way, it's just happened, we'll find a way. <sighs> anyway, the true cost, of the human cost of this is impossible to describe. What we need to figure out now is when can she come? She, you know, we're planning for her to come to Ghana as soon as possible, meet my family, and, and then we have to think about how do we build going forward, you know? And that's something you have to take day by day. How often were you touching base with Ghana? Um, quite often. Well, before the detention. So before, before the, the arrest. Yeah, so before the arrest, I was, I would come back to Ghana. So the last time I was in Ghana was in March of 2011. Um, it was only for three days. Um, it was for my granddad's funeral. Before that, I think, uh, I'm going to say two years before that, I came for two weeks or three weeks holiday. So 
I think before I started work, I, was, I would come back to Ghana every two years. When I was at school, we would come back every summer for two months or so. Once I started work, it was maybe every two or three years, but for two weeks at a time. Um, and then, of course, I was in touch with my cousin and my uncle. We were, um, uh, there was a, a young boy called King that I was helping to put him through school. So I would be speaking to my, my, my uncle and my cousin to try and look after him as best we could. It wasn't easy, but we were trying our best. Um, and then, of course, it got really busy and it was difficult to maintain the right level of coming back. But every two or three years. Yeah. Do you have any biological um, children? You talked about people. No, no children of my own. No yeah. children of my own. So Now, you, you never had the opportunity to say a proper goodbye to all those um, family and friends in, in the UK. And, mm. and Alice, where this interview is, is going to be seen across Europe, especially in London uh, via ABN television. You have the opportunity to speak to them and um, you know, tell them a, a proper goodbye or why you couldn't say a proper goodbye. Yeah. You can look into the camera. <laughs> I think, um, Israel, why are you doing this to me, man? It is um, an incredible opportunity to get to say, first of all, thank you. I need to say thank you to everyone who has campaigned. I need to say thank you to Pip and Roe for giving me a home. I need to say thank you to Hannah Bardell, my MP, who fought so hard, so hard. I need to say thank you to Jacqueline McKenzie. I need to say thank you to everyone on the Keep Kwaku chat, to everyone at my school, the Acrothal Scholars. There are so many people to say thank you to, to Nick Hopewell-Smith, for all that you have done without asking for a penny of payment, just because it was the right thing to do. I need to say thank you to everyone who signed the petition, everyone who signed the open letters, my colleagues at the Forward Institute. There are so many people, my old school friends. There was a campaign that was started here in Ghana as well. And I need to say thank you to everyone who fought in Ghana too, and my family here, my mother, my father, everyone. It has been such a battle. Israel, thank you for the opportunity to say goodbye. I'm sorry that we couldn't do it properly. I'm sorry that the Home Office took me away in the way that they did so that I couldn't say goodbye properly. However, one final thing I have to say. This fight is not over. It's not really goodbye. I don't think that we lost. I don't think it's over. We will keep fighting because it's the right thing to do. We will change the law because it's the right thing to do. We will get the Shaw Amendment so that those who were born or brought up in the UK should no longer be deported. That's what we're fighting for. And I think the guys back in the UK and in Ghana will continue to do that because it's the right thing to do. The most important thing is you're home and free. Great group. <laughs> <laughs> I need to stop crying, but yeah. yes, you're right. I am home and I'm free. I'm free. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Welcome. It's been a pleasure. Home Thank you so again. much. Thank you.